uh, that is joint work with uh, joint work with Xavier Vives, um, and um, it, it's a new paper that we started um, at the end of last year. Oh, oh, there is. So what's the idea here? Well, um, as Eduardo said, I published a paper uh, with Martin Schmanz and Isabel Teku called Anti-Competitive Effects of Common Ownership, and which essentially said, well, there are these theories that say that if all the companies have the same owners, then we should expect to see uh, anti-competitive behavior. And the way we would test that is we would expect to see uh, if that theory is correct, uh, we would see higher prices in, in every industry. Right. On the other hand, if there are too many agency frictions uh, that um, mean that the shareholders' preferences for higher prices don't get to uh, be implemented as company policies, then maybe we don't see anything. Um, and so the way we test this is by running regressions of prices on uh, measures of common ownership um, and seeing if the effect is, is positive. Um, so this sounds good and it's very simple, but I'm going to argue today that it's maybe too simple. And the reason is that um, this, uh, this theory that says that anti-competitive effects um, lead to higher prices, that, un that common ownership leads to higher prices in, should lead to higher prices in all industries, common ownership by these big three that own very diversified portfolios, is based on partial equilibrium uh, theory. And uh, the big three don't own just one industry, they own all the industries, right? So we could think of it, well, maybe we can just apply partial equilibrium theory in each industry uh, and that will, uh, and the conclusions will be the same. It, it doesn't matter, but it turns out, and this is based on this theoretical work that I did with Vives uh, that was published last year. Uh, in general equilibrium, the insight is actually different. So if you have the whole economy, you don't necessarily want higher prices in every industry. And that's not where you will, you will extract rents from someone, uh, but you don't necessarily want to extract rents uh, from consumers. Um, so it sounds, this sounds a little bit maybe counterintuitive because we're used to thinking about oligopoly using uh, mental models that were based on partial equilibrium theory. So everything that we think we know about oligopoly is based on partial equilibrium. Oh, the slides are not full screen? No, we only see the first one. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can't see my slides? I, I think probably I mean, you shared oh. uh, a wrong screen and we only see the, the first one, uh, but we not full the, screen. We see the slides, but they're not full screen. So you, if you can view full screen or something like this, then we can see the full slides. Uh, they, they, they are full screen for me. Um, can you can you see that I'm changing the slides? Oh, no. Um, okay. Okay. Let, let me uh, stop sharing and share share them again. Um, okay. Okay. There are my slides. Can you see them? Another not full screen. Uh, what about now? Better? Yes, now we see it for screen. Um, okay. Um, okay. So the idea uh, is that, at least in theory, in general equilibrium, the, the result flips and common ownership can actually lead to lower markups in the product market. It can lead to higher markdowns in the labor market, so you can exploit workers more. But if you own the whole economy and you um, increase prices in every industry, yeah, you haven't achieved anything as a shareholder. You've only increased the price level. And if you value your wealth relative to the price level, uh, you reduced the, value, the real value of your wealth. Or at least you've, you've not increased, you haven't increased it. I mean, it could be that you increase the profits by raising the prices in nominal terms, but then you divide it by the price level and that 
um, reduces the real value of your wealth. So you don't want to do that in general equilibrium. In partial equilibrium, you don't see this because you only focus on one industry. And you say, okay, if I raise the prices in this industry, in partial equilibrium, the price level is exogenous. You take it as given and you don't, the industry is very small compared to the price index. And you don't have that effect. But that effect, if you own all the industries, suddenly it's not small. And um, as a shareholder that's diversified and values the real value of their wealth, um, the intuition is that you don't want to do that. So that's that's a bit the insight of Azar and Vives. Uh, another, another way of seeing it is, that, as we will see, um, if you expand production in an industry, that will um, reduce the relative price of that industry and increase the relative price of the other industries. And so if you own all the other industries in the first order conditions, this is like a pecuniary externality that expanding in one industry generates on the other industry. So it creates a positive externality of increasing the relative price. And it's like, there's different ways of, of seeing this in the theory. But the main point is in general equilibrium, this insight that common ownership should lead to higher prices in every industry uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Um, okay, so what is this paper going to do? We're going to uh, measure common ownership, intra-industry, and each of the theory uh, of Azar and Vives is that intra-industry common ownership should have a positive effect, but inter-industry should have a negative effect. Um, right, intra-industry common ownership is when airlines have common shareholders between themselves, like you take a pair of airlines, they're in the same industry, so that's intra-industry common ownership. If you, if you take an airline and a company in the S&P 500 that's not an airline, if they have a common ownership, that's inter-industry uh, common ownership. Um, we're going to address some of the criticisms of the airlines paper. Um, for example, the fact that like our measures of common ownership include market shares. Um, we're going to use instruments that don't include market shares that are simple averages of the common ownership um, lambdas without market shares. And um, we're also going to separate out the big three. Um, and we're gonna estimate their effects separately. And we're gonna show that the big three have a negative effect on prices in airlines, while the other shareholders that are more, less diversified and more specialized in the airlines have a positive effect on prices. So the positive effect that we saw in uh, AST 2018 came from other shareholders, but not from the big three. So in a way, the logic of AST was not completely correct because we were motivating the paper by this big rise in common ownership. Then we tested with everyone together and found a positive effect, but that positive effect was not coming from the big three. And then the, it, this led to a policy debate in which it was like, well, what do we do about this giant three and how do we regulate them and so on, where actually the, the negative, the positive effect of, on prices were not really coming from them. It's just the motivation was coming from them. But then actually, when you look more closely, it's not the big three. Um, um, okay, so this suggests that general equilibrium effects could be important in oligopoly with common ownership. They may not be very important in merger analysis or in antitrust, uh, in most of antitrust, but in the case of common ownership, because it's something that covers the whole economy, is something where you really need to take it seriously um, general equilibrium effects. Um, okay, so this is a, a, the theory of Azar and Vives, or a version of it, um, of the paper that we published last year. Let's say we have an economy with N industries and each of them offers a different product, JN, uh, sorry, a different product and there's JN firms in the industry. So we have a set of industries in each of them there's a set of firms uh, with JN firms in industry N. We're gonna have worker consumers that are going to work for the firms and consume the products of the firms. Um, and they have utility for consumption, a consumption bundle and uh, for labor. So they don't like um, working too many, too much, uh, but they like consuming. 
um, the consumption is an area of the of the products of all the industries. And firms in sector N produce the good CN using labor as a factor of production with a production function that's F and J of L and J. So it just how much workers you hire determines how much you produce. And that creates an output Y and J. The sum of all the Y and J's has to equal the consumption in the sector. And it has profits given by uh, the price of their sector, of the product in their sector times the, their output minus the wage times the number of workers that they have. Um, and we're gonna assume that the firms are owned by, are owned by a set of owners who uh, own the firms and they receive the profits and they use the profits to consume uh, the products that, they, that the economy produces. And they obtain utility CI, so, right? so they consume a, a basket of these goods. Um, so we're going to assume for now, and then we're, we'll go into the objective function of the firm, but we're going to assume that the firm maximizes the real value of its profits. So those are the profits divided by the price level, plus uh, sums of the real value of the profits of the other firms in the same industry, weighted down or up by these lambdas, which reflect how much common ownership there is in trade industry, and the sum of the real value of the profits of the firm seen other industries, also weighted by lambdas, which reflect the inter-industry common ownership. Um, so the firms decide how many workers to employ, um, and that determines labor demand, L, and that in turn determines the real wage in the economy. And the labor demands in each sector um, determine how much is produced in each sector, and that determines the, the relative prices, uh, the relative the relative supplies of the different of the different sectors, determine the relative prices based on this um, Dixit Stiglitz like uh, function. Oh, somebody has a question, uh, Giuseppe Dari. Uh, I uh, Jose, sorry, just uh, just to clarify here. So I I think. You know, one one of the lang tell me if I'm wrong, but one of the lang assumption is that this uh, investment firms they are collecting money equally uh, across the population, or to put it differently, that the consumption is determined by workers. But we know that access to financial markets is need is not you know the same for everybody. So let's say the rich are investing more than the poor, and therefore the firms are more likely to cater to the interests of the rich. And therefore, I would suspect there's going to be some transfers, you know, if you have common ownership from markets where the poor are investing to markets where the rich are investing, trying to increase prices in one set and reduce prices in others. So can you capture any of this in, in the model or in the empirical analysis? Well, I think that, uh, let me see if I understand your question. I mean, I think, by this answer, I think that, um, so we have, worker consumers that don't own the firms and don't control them. And then we have the owner consumers that are the ones that control the own and control the firms. Uh, so there are two classes of people which would be like the rich and the poor in this model. And uh, this is not a representative agent uh, model. Uh, now we, we don't call them the rich and the poor. I mean, they're more, uh, they're classified into owners and, and workers and both are consumers. Uh, Right, so the firms will act in the will try to maximize the the utility of the of the rich here, and to the extent that they can, they would try to exploit the the non owners of the firms, which are the worker consumers. Um, right now, in the but what's going to happen here is that the um, if if you have both market power in labor and product markets then you will exploit the worker consumers because they're workers. And so you will create a markdown, a labor market wedge. That means that the wage is going to be below the marginal product of labor. Uh, and that's because the firms are controlled by, because not everybody is equal, and uh, the firms are controlled by the owner consumers that don't work. Um, so they, they choose to uh, have this wedge that reduces the, uh, the real wage below the marginal product of labor. Um, yeah, but so, they don't so, choose to, to have a wedge on consumers because they themselves are consumers. So is the assumption that, 
that all the consumers buy the same goods. That's the assumptions. Yes, exactly. But so they different goods, right? The, the owners buy yachts and, and, and the, the, the workers buy food, let's say, right? Yeah, well, let me, let me put it this way. So if the owners, they could, they if could, the owners squeeze, buy yachts, they could, they could squeeze the workers in the product market. That's what I mean. Yes, if the owners buy yachts and not, the owners buying yachts is not enough. I mean, they could buy different goods, but as long as the as long as the goods are connected in in a way, in the sense that like if the if the consumer price index goes up, the price of yachts also goes up. Uh, for some reason, for whatever reason, I mean, and if somehow the increasing prices in such a way that it increase, increases the consumer price index for the workers, also increases the prices of yachts, then um, then you would still not want to increase the prices across the, the whole economy. Uh, but maybe if the yachts are independent of the consumer price index, then yes, uh, then you would want to increase the prices uh, on consumers. So that, that's right. I mean, here, let me put it this way. When the first time when uh, I wrote this model, I didn't really buy it actually. Like, because exactly, of, because exactly because of what you're saying, because I was like, I don't understand. I mean, like, Common ownership is reducing the product market markup, markup in the model, and it has to be. I thought it has to be because the because we have no savings in the model, and the rich probably save most of the money, and so they don't consume as much. And because we're missing that, we're getting this weird result that they that they don't want to uh, exploit the consumers. Um, the problem with that is that suppose even if they were saving, I mean. I think that even if they were saving some of the money that you don't really need to assume, uh, you, you could still have something like this result. And the reason is if they value those savings relative to the price level, then that's, this is still the case, right? Um, so it, basically what I'm assuming mentally is that uh, the, the owners have some wealth and maybe they don't even have to consume that wealth literally they just have to divide that wealth by the price level. It's like you have the standard poor shares in the standard poor 500. And if it goes up because there's inflation, uh, you're not saying, oh, this is great. The standard poor went up. You're like, well, how much did the standard poor go up last year? And I'm gonna subtract from that the rate of growth of inflation to see how happy I am uh, with that. You see what I mean? And if it if the standard poor in, if there was five percent inflation and if the standard poor went up five percent and inflation goes up five percent, I'm like that's the same for me as an owner. But if you're if the yacht story is true, you could say well in that case what you would see is the standard the price in the the price index would go up, infl inflation would be five percent, uh, the standard poor go up would go up five percent, but the people who are own the standard poor would be like. Oh, we don't really care about inflation because yachts increase by zero percent, and they're independent of inflation. And um, and that could be the case. I mean, I'm not saying it's not the case. I'm just saying that's what would, what you would really need. And that if you have like 10 percent inflation and the standard poor goes up 10 percent, rich people are like, this is great because we actually buy yachts and yachts. The inflation for yachts was zero percent. Um. Now maybe, and, and maybe that's how the world works. I mean, because maybe I'm wrong in my intuition because maybe my intuition is that inflation is the same for rich people and for poor people, more or less, uh, in terms of their product to, to a first order. Of course, there can be second order things, but maybe that intuition is based on inflation that's driven by monetary policy and by printing money and inflation that's driven by market power could be different. Um, Right. So most of inflation is driven by monetary policy, and that's gonna just increase all everything, yachts and uh, milk. Right. But maybe in the in the real world, we could have just a, a change in, mar in market power or in ownership structure such that yachts actually don't increase, milk does increase, and um, you could definitely have this kind of stuff. Um, so in the end. Um, I think this is the kind of stuff that we want to think about. Um, so I think that's a great question and a, a great kind of like topic for 
future research. I mean, I think that we get a very crisp result that gives us a nice intuition for why they may not want to raise the prices. And then you could like kick that result and, and find that it's not always uh, that, uh, that way. Um, okay, we're gonna shut down the labor market uh, wedge though. So even though you, want, you may not want to increase prices, you increase uh, when you have more common ownership. And we're gonna shut that down by, by assuming that the firms have no market power in the labor market. We have that in the theory paper. But here we just want to focus on the on the product market uh, markup. Um, so okay, we define equilibrium as um, essentially there is like two um, two conditions. One, uh, an equilibrium is a set of production plans by the firms such that these production plans uh, and a set of relative prices. Sorry. And a set of, of prices and production plans by the firms, such as the production plans by the firms and the relative prices are a competitive equilibrium. And what that means is they solve these equations, right? So the firms take, uh, know these equations, they know how the, the production plans are gonna impact prices. And then that, that the production vector is a Nash equilibrium of the game in which the firms are maximizing their object, these objective functions, knowing that the prices would change according to these equations um, when they uh, change their production plans. So in a, in a way, it's just like playing like a Cournot, but instead of playing it with a demand function in partial equilibrium, you play it with these demand functions, right? With these price functions uh, as, a, as a function of the employments. So it's very similar to Cournot. It's just called, so that's why it's called Cournot Valras. Um, and we call it with shareholder representation because we're saying the firms acting in the interest of the shareholders instead of maximizing profits. Which is what the proponent of Kono Walras equilibrium, which was Kapsevich and Vial, uh, assumed, and that led to a lot of problems in the past. Which was uh, that um, if you assume that they maximize profits in general equilibrium, uh, the objective function depends on the choice of numerator, and there's like technical issues with that. So if you assume that they act in the interest of the shareholders, you don't have that problem because everything is in real terms. Um, so, okay, anyway, but that's what, that was more the theory paper. Uh, let, let's move on to the empirics. Um, okay, so what happens if, uh, what, are, what are the trade-offs that the firm faces? Suppose the firm is considering hiring an extra worker. Firm J in sector N, uh, what's that going to do? Uh, well, it's going to decrease the relative price in its sector, rho M, and it's going to increase the relative price in all the other sectors. Because if it hires an extra worker, it's going to increase the relative supply of its own sector by producing more. And that's going to in, uh, decrease the relative price of its sector. And it's going to decrease the relative supply of all the other sectors and increase the relative supply, uh, so, sorry, the increase the relative price of all the other sectors. So if it hires more workers, it knows that it's going to decrease its own price and increase the price for um, all the other industries in the economy. Um, and so you have the value of the marginal product of labor minus the wage is equal to uh, these two terms. This one captures the own industry a relative price effect and you, the more intra-industry common ownership, the bigger this effect is going to be. Um, and this is positive, right? Because you have a negative and a negative. And the, the bigger this lambda intra-industry, uh, the more you're going to suffer from the fact that the, all, that, the, that the relative price in your industry has gone down because you expanded production, because it affects not only you, but then it affects all the firms in your industry. And if you own, if your shareholders own those and you care about that, uh, then that's even worse for you. So you, that gives you less of an incentive to expand. But on the other hand, you have this positive effect on all the other industries. So the more inter-industry common ownership you have, the more you internalize the fact that you're expanding. Uh, when you expand your industry, it, in, it reduces the relative supply of all the other industries and that increases the relative price of all the other industries. And the more uh, common ownership you have, 
the more uh, with other industries, you, the more weight your shareholders are going to put on those, and um, the bigger this effect is going to be. And this effect is negative on the market. Uh, okay, so you have these two effects. Um, so the more intra-industry common ownership you have, uh, the less incentive you, ha you have to increase employment, but the more inter-industry common ownership you have, the more incentive you have to increase employment. So you're gonna, in the end, how much employment you have is going to balance, balance these things and that's gonna create a markup or a markup. Yeah, Andrea. Um, yeah, thank you. I have a question here. It seems, uh, if I understand correctly, in your model, the kind of competition between, uh, or, or this, this channel is the labor labor supply, let's say. So I take away labor from other industries, therefore I, I shift the uh, balance. But um, I was thinking in standard Cournot, there's also a claim or that common ownership might be a good thing if there is, if industry do not all produce consumer goods, but also produce intermediate goods, right? So in your model, you only have consumer goods, but I expect a similar uh, result in the case of which Let's say I have common ownership of uh, a consumer good or a company that makes airplanes and a company that makes engines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can make a similar optimization problem in that, co in that context that does not include labor. Did you also think about modeling that or is this, do you think, redundant in your model? Would, would, would it make a difference? Yeah, we thought about it. Um, I think that, well, and, and let me say that, yes, and that's important, you know, elimination of double marginalization. I think that's what you're talking about. and. Uh, we thought about doing it. We didn't want to overcomplicate the model, but I think that also, first of all, empirically, it's going to be hard to separate that because suddenly we start having like a lot of measures of common ownership, and uh, we we may be empirically capturing a bit of that and a bit of this. And I was talking with uh, with Vives about this stuff, you know, and he was like, "Well, we have to say that it could be that, or it could be this." But I'm, what I told him is. Um, actually, I think that the two things are are quite similar. Uh, in a way, because in in one way, in one of them, you're not in. You don't want to increase the price of a company because you're buying because because you're dire directly buying from it. And in the other one, you don't want to increase the price of a company. You don't want to increase the markup uh, because a company that you own buys inputs from it, right? And I think the intuition for those two is actually quite similar. Um, it's just, I think that for these, there's different ways of seeing the, in the intuition. Uh, maybe the way I just said the intuition is actually a little bit different. But I think what's going on is similar. And you see that, especially when you think about the limiting case of like, you don't want to increase, you're dividing by the price level and you don't want to increase the price level. And the reason you don't is because you're, you're, you're buying the products, you're a consumer of the products. And I think that double, double marginalization it, common ownership and double marginalization is a little bit like being a consumer of the products, except that you consume through a company that buys them as inputs, right? But definitely you don't want to, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, exactly, yeah, I agree. I, I, the thing, it makes, it makes sense. I thought uh, immediately of the other mechanism was that it feels to me like the impact of a single firm on the price level is much more than the impact of a single form, firm on intermediate goods, let's say. But I agree that the channel should be equivalent. I'm just considering well, like empirically how much a company can affect the price level as a, in the whole economy. Well, let me put it this way. I mean, the impact of a company on the price level, let's say is infinitesimal, right? But the impact of a company on uh, the portfolio profits is also infinitesimal. So it's like, if you're really, here, we're, here it's actually not infinitesimal because you have finite firms but it could be almost infinitesimal. And there's a difference uh, between infinitesimal and almost infinitesimal, but they're, they're all the, of the same order of magnitude. I mean, the thing is here is like, if a, firm, firms, if a firm is small relative to the whole economy, it's going to impact the price level not very much, um, but uh, it's also not going to impact your profits very much. So it's, in a way it's like, we're talking about like, a lot, a lot of very small things put together. In the end, both are large. Yeah, uh, I see. Yeah. Right. So it's like, but when you focus on one firm in, in partial equilibrium, everything looks large. Um, but it's like these shareholders are like, well, I have, I have ten thousand firms, and each of them 
all of them jointly determine the price level and all of them jointly determine my profits and the value of my wealth. Each of them though has very little impact on the price level and each of them has very little impact on my wealth. Um, so if you think about it that way, it's like, I, I, don't, ki I don't care at all about what these firms do. But in the end, you, you care a little, like actually, you actually care a tiny little bit about the fact that they can have profits and you have a, care a tiny little bit about the fact that they can change the price level a little bit. Um, yeah, of course, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Also makes a lot of sense in the context of the big three that own like a significant portion of, of firms, right? So yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so the result is that we get this formula for the markup in the end that basically when you take this first order condition and you start solving for the markup, you get this. Um, so what you get is like, is this, the, the relative price of, the, uh, of, of sector N minus the marginal cost, uh, which is the wage over the marginal product, right? That's the marginal cost, how much you have to pay the worker divided by the units that that worker is going to, or divided by how many times how many workers you need, which is one over the marginal product divided by the price, right? Which looks a lot like P minus C over C, like the learner index. It is the learner, the learner index is equal to this part here, one over theta times one minus SN, the, the market share of sector N. This is the inverse elasticity of sector N. Um, so the learner index is equal to the inverse elasticity uh, times the market share of firm J in sector N plus uh, one minus the market share from J in sector N times the lam times lambda intra, um, so times the intra industry common ownership minus the inter-industry common ownership average. Well, these are weighted average by market share. So this is what you, you get in the model. Um, so in particular, if you don't have any common ownership, you just get like Kuno, right? So the market share over the elasticity uh, is the markup the SMJ uh, times the inverse elasticity. If you have full common ownership intra-industry, but no inter-industry common ownership, you get full monopoly, right? Just like in O'Brien and Salo. Um, but if you have full intra-industry and full inter-industry common ownership, fully diversified portfolios, then this is equal to one minus one, which is zero. So you said price equal marginal cost. So you shut down the product market wedge and we've shut down here the labor market wedge. Um, if we hadn't shut it down, we'd have that the labor market, which would be a full monopsony if you had market portfolios, right? It's like you control all the labor markets, but you don't use your market power in the product market at all uh, because of this. Um, but of course, as um, uh, uh, as Giuseppe had said, um, this is because the rich and the poor consume or think of things in terms of the same price level. If the rich had a different price index, uh, then things would be different and you could maybe extract rents from the poor. Um, okay, so these motivates are measures for the, for the paper. So the empirical, on the empirical side, we're going to do prices as a function of average lambda intra and average lambda inter and weighted averages. But we're going to instrument those weighted averages with simple averages that don't depend on market shares. Um, the identification assumption is that ownership is exogenous, which is the same thing that the structural people uh, use. And And, but we would also we would also relax that by doing an event study. Um, okay, so we also discussed well. We we took the objective of the firm as given. Uh, we would like to think a little bit more about that, and especially try to make it a little more realistic and say, well, what if the owner consumers didn't uh, own the firms directly, but they own them by uh, as we as we did assume in the in the theory model, and now we're saying, well, let's change the theory a little bit. But actually, it, it's going to be the same. Um, instead of on the firms directly, let's say they, they own them through asset managers. So the asset managers offer a, a menu of mutual funds that, the, that people can choose from, and people uh, they are G asset managers, and 
uh, the people by the mutual funds from the asset managers. And the asset managers are the ones that hold uh, the firm, right? So let's say asset manager G holds B, beta, G and J in firm J in sector N. And they charge a small fee, and let's say it's infinitesimal, which is a percentage of their assets under management. Um, The owner consumers derive uh, utility from the real value of the profits and the asset managers derive utility from the real value of the fees. So the asset managers charge a fee that's proportional to the profits in their portfolio. And then div they divide that by the price level. So they multiply the profits times a constant fee, and let's say 0.1% of the assets under management, which are the value of the profits because it's static. I was able to discount the present value and they divide it by the price level. So they take it in real terms. So the utility of asset manager J is proportional with where the constant of proportionality is the fee to the value of the portfolio divided by the price level. Um, and then the uh, asset manager J has control given by gamma J, uh, gamma G and J. And the control is their bunch of voting power index. So it measures how much voting power they have uh, within the firm. And then we assume that the objective function of the firm is a weighted average of the objective function of the asset managers, where the weights are given by the control uh, shares that they have, gamma. Uh, and then you can solve, uh, you, you can rewrite this as the objective function of the firm that we had before, where these lambdas are the sum of gamma, G and J, times beta G and K divided by the sum of gamma G and J times beta uh, G and J, which is how much weight the firm puts uh, on the profits of the other uh, firms in the economy. Right, these lambdas. Um, okay, so we're going to implement these measures empirically. And for that, we need to make we need a theory of control, right? So we need um, to know what the control weights are. Um, I, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Mm -hmm. So somehow, you know, that, uh, you know, that micro foundation, uh, you know, which rationalizes um, the problem of the, of, the, of the firm, of the firm's owners, you know, here the, here the idea would be that if you were a consumer, a consumer owner, and you were, you know, you would be harmed by uh, by inflation. So, you know, you would press asset managers to, you know, to express those concerns in their voting behavior uh, with the firms. So, in some sense, basically, what you're telling us is, asset managers will be pressing the firms not to increase prices. Is this correct? Um, well, I didn't say that they're pressing the firms not to increase prices. Yeah, you um, did not, but this is- what, I, what, what I'm saying is that the firms will, here, the firms will maximize a weighted average of what the asset managers want. What I'm saying is that the asset managers don't want higher prices. Yeah, so in some sense, basically, yeah. So, but that will be the implication that uh, ultimately, firms are not gonna want to increase the prices of their products because uh, somehow that's affected uh, by the voting behavior of the asset managers who collectively own the firm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you, do we have any evidence on you know actually on on that on this type of uh, behavior being reflected in the data? So you know, I, I wonder to what extent uh, if a firm uh, first of all, I wonder to what extent it is it is even known to um, asset managers uh, how the firms um, you know compute the prices of the products, and even if they would know that, to what extent they would actually press the firm not to increase prices. Well, I mean, we don't have a lot of direct evidence. I, I think that, and I, this is something that I want to add to the paper because um, I think that people have pointed this out before. Um, we, what we do know is that the asset managers do talk about um, the fact that they don't want to increase prices. I mean, the main reason they've talked about this is because we said first that they wanted to increase prices. And so um, the founder of BlackRock, I mean, I think uh, 
she wrote an article for Harvard uh, corporate governance blog, and in other and, and in other papers that she wrote with BlackRock, saying um, we don't have any incentive to we don't want the firms to increase prices because uh, we own the other firms and also our, our clients uh, buy airline products and they don't want higher prices. So they basically said exactly this uh, this theory uh, or or something very similar to this. And they, and she said inter industry. Uh, common ownership, you know, means that uh, we don't want to increase prices. Okay, but this is not not wanting. I mean, I, I understand actually, I mean, I don't have an issue with the theory. I'm just wondering, you know, how that actually works in practice, because I can understand that we don't have an, that she may say we don't have an interest in uh, in firms increasing prices because we own the whole, it's actually the whole, the whole, the universe of, of firms. So ultimately it's just, uh, it's just harming consumers and it's harming us. Uh, so I can understand they, they wouldn't want that, but I wonder to what extent they actually um, affect firms through their voting behavior not to increase prices. Because there are, there are a lot of things that I don't want to, but you know, I cannot change. You know, I don't think I have the voting power to change them. So I wonder to what extent actually this is uh, the uh, BlackRock and uh, you know, the, the big three actually believe that they can affect uh, prices and they actually uh, do so through their through their actively uh, pursue pursue this goal uh, in their involvement. Yeah. No, I see, what, I, see what, I see what I mean. Actually, I was thinking of presenting a different paper today. I mean, I'm presenting this one um, because it's relatively fresh and, uh, and the, other one is, the other one is even fresher and I don't have slides yet. And I, and I didn't have that to make slides, which is um, a structural paper that does something very similar to this one, but from a structural point of view. And there, we have a slightly different uh, theory of the firm, which is based on this paper that I published in the Chicago Review um, a couple of years ago. And there we have managerial entrenchment, right? So there the, the firms don't necessarily act in the interest of the shareholders. Actually the managers in that model, and maybe this is more like the model you have in your, in your mind, uh, the managers do whatever they want. And so first we have to say, okay, what do the managers want? And we say, well, let's, Let's say that the managers have shares in the in their firm, and they don't have like a diversified portfolio, because we incentivize them by giving them shares or options or things like that. And so the managers, if you leave them alone, if you leave them alone alone, you don't give them shares, they're gonna, I don't know, go to the Bahamas. But if you don't leave them completely alone, but you more or less don't talk with them, but you give them shares, they're going to maximize the profits of the firm. Not what the shareholders want, because the shareholders want, want this complicated thing that I just talked about, right? Um, so what can the shareholders do? Well, at the same time, the managers, even though they have their own direct utility from, what the, from the firm's uh, strategy, they also have utility, uh, negative utility from shareholder dissent. So the managers don't want to have the shareholders against them. And there, there is good evidence that shareholder dissent, different ways of shareholder dissent hurts managers, even if they are somewhat entrenched. But they, of course they could be more or less entrenched and these are parameters that say, well, how much weight are the shareholders gonna have uh, in the objective of the firm? So you have this objective function that is of the managers, the, the utility of the managers, minus uh, the fact that the managers don't want the shareholders to vote against them or lower their pay, or in general be pissed at them. Um, right, but the, but of course that becomes a much much blurrier, right? Because it's not like the shareholders are going to go and they're going to tell you, um, we want you to uh, increase airline prices, guys, or not increase them, or anything as explicit as that, because that's very dangerous for shareholders, obviously, right? But you can have conversations uh, with managers about strategy that are a bit more general than that, uh, and that may give them a hint if they're smart about whether you want them to expand more or not expand as much uh, or things like that in general. Of course, you, you wouldn't do this at the road level, um, but you could affect the competitive strategy of the firms. And actually competitive strategy is one of the things, not competitive strategy, strategy, which is co affects competitive strategy, is one of the things that the engagement uh, documents of BlackRock and so on say is one of their priorities when they talk about when they talk with the firm, they do talk about strategy, but obviously they're not gonna be saying prices necessarily. The strategy means how fast are you gonna grow this year? How much capital are you gonna to have to deploy? And things like that, which in the end, then they filter into prices, right? So there's a lot of layers. Um, 
but then you also have the layer that maybe the manager just doesn't care at all, right? About what the shareholders say because they can't kick them out. It's very hard. And shareholder dissent is not so costly for the managers. So let's say it is costly. And in general, the managers, all is equal. They would rather have keep the shareholders happy. Um, so yes, it is a bit of a game in which the managers have to guess what the shareholders want. And the shareholders want to communicate to the managers what they want, but they cannot do it in a very refined way or in a very precise way uh, necessarily. They, they have to do it in private meetings that we don't observe. And uh, they may talk about different things in those meetings. Obviously things that affect strategy are gonna be first order uh, there, but they may not be micromanaging the firm. Uh, right, so they have to communicate then, and then the management has to understand what the shareholders are trying to communicate to them. And, and then there's the game that the managers, uh, if they're rational, they're going to try to uh, act, to, to move towards what the shareholders want compared to what they would want without the shareholders, but not necessarily 100%. So you're going to have kind of like a partial. What you're going to have is that in the structural model, we find that uh, the data reject uh, this theory that I just told you. And they also reject pure profit maximization. What, they, what it supports is something in between. Um, in the extent of time, can I suggest to go uh, through the empirical results so then we have a little bit of time for Q&A also? Because it's uh, uh, yes. 20 yes, past one. Yes, thanks. Okay. Uh, Vladimir, I hope that uh, that was helpful. Um, okay, so let's go to the empirics, which we're almost there. Okay, so what are we going to do? We use route level data on airline prices, exactly the same data actually as in the airlines paper, and data on ownership, um, also exactly the same. Uh, so we, took, we take the same data. We calculate the Bandshaft voting power index using Monte Carlo simulation. And based on that, we calculate the lambdas for each pair of airlines and the lambda between the airlines and the other firms in the S&P 500. Uh, and we calculate weighted averages of these lambdas and unweighted averages of these lambdas that we're gonna use as instruments. And these lambdas that we're gonna use are a uh, firm level, they're not route level, precisely because of concerns like what Vladimir was saying, like basically I think, uh, and we have to be more explicit about this because we, a referee was like, uh, oh, route level, I don't believe it, blah, blah. No, 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 the, the measures are at the firm level because you guys have beaten up us up so much uh, not believing route level things. So we're doing it at the firm level uh, from the get-go. Um, okay, so these are the bunch of, the percent of, of ownership and the bunch of voting power index. And what you can see here is that the control that the top 10 shareholders have over the firms is much higher than their ownership stake because of the bunch of voting power tends to give more weight to large shareholders. The bunch of one of the properties that it has and why it's better than proportional control, which is used in a lot of the literature, is that um, as the votes reach 50%, control goes to 100%, as opposed to pro proportional control where 50% of the votes gives you 50% of control, even though you would win a re-election. Um, and so the bunch of tends to give more than proportional control to the large shareholders, and less than proportional to the small shareholders, which are not listed here among the top 10. So if you have like 20% of the votes, you may have 40 something percent of control of the firm. And if you have 50% of the votes, you may have 70%, like in JetBlue. Uh, here, for example, Deutsche Lufthansa had 15% or 16% of the, of the votes or of ownership, and they had 26, 27% uh, of control of JetBlue. Um, Okay, these are summary stats. You have the lambda intra and the lambda inter. And the lambda intra is still a little bit higher than the lambda inter. So there's more intra industry than inter industry common ownership. This tells you the weights that the different airlines put on the competitors in 2014 and the average weight that they put on the, on the competitors and on uh, non airline SP 500 firms. Uh, as you can see, in general, they put more weight in the airlines than in non s 500 firms. And some, some of them put much more weight than others, right? Um, again, as a caveat, this is, these are based on a model without managerial entrenchment. With entrenchment, uh, the, the actual weights that they put are probably smaller 
and that's what we find in a structural model. Um, so you're gonna weigh this down and in reality, but this is a measure of how much weight you would put if, if you just represented the shareholders and you didn't have any agency or managerial entrenchment. Um, okay, and this is our main result. I mean, essentially we run this regression and we find that Lambda Intra has a positive uh, effect uh, on prices and Lambda Intra has a negative effect on prices. Uh, if you put Lambda Intra alone, it has a positive effect on prices, but not as large. So there's omitted variable bias here. If you, uh, if you omit Lambda Intra, you're actually going to be underestimating the intra-industry effect. Uh, but the overall effect on prices is going to be lower because of the lambda inter. Um, sorry, um, I'm sorry, how do you compute this lambda inter and inter in your in your I mean, we compute I'm them sure by the slide, but I missed that. Yeah, so uh, based on this formula. No, no, uh, but in, in, in your data. Yeah, you based on the data in the data we have the betas, the betas are the ownership shares. Mm -hmm. Uh, the gammas are the control shares, which are the bunch of indices. So you calculate the, the bunch of is the fraction of times that you're gonna be pivotal uh, in the elections if all the other shareholders- oh, What I mean is, what does inter and intra refer to? It's inter-industry or intra-industry? And in your context of your airlines, intra-industry or intra-industry is what, like different uh, routes or what is it? Um, no, the intra-industry is the average weight. So let's say American puts a weight of 0 0.39 in Alaska, 0 0.41 in JetBlue, 0 0.5 in Delta, 0 0.21 in Frontier, 0 0.77 in Allegiant, 0 0.28 in Hawaiian, and 0 0.37 in SkyWest, 1.15 in United, and 0 0.35 in Southwest. American's intra-industry, Lambda, is the average of this. It's a weighted average, weighted by national market shares. Um, but we also do the unweighted average as an instrument so because then it doesn't have market shares. Uh, and the inter-industry one is the same, but instead of the weight that American puts on the airlines, it's the weight that it puts on the non-airlines under and poor 500 uh, firms. Um, if we instrument using the unweighted ones, we get very similar results. Um, of course, here we have like, as in, it's the same controls, the same specifications as in the airlines paper. Uh, controlling for market carrier fixed effects, year quarter fixed effects, in some of them uh, extra controls that take into account with presence of low cost carriers uh, and things like that. Uh, and distance times uh, year quarter fixed effects to control for things like changes in the oil price affecting uh, different routes uh, differently and things like that. Um, so the overall change in prices uh, is positive, but not as high. Although, well, I think it's, well, actually I should check whether it's on average lower than the one in the partial equilibrium paper. Uh, if we do route level, it's also similar, especially if you instrument the coefficients are actually similar in magnitude. Route level means what if we actually did route level? The lambda intra, we could also do it at the route level, right? Not doing the average across all the airlines with national shares, but only the average of the airlines in your route with route level shares. In that case, things are, are fairly similar. So that doesn't matter. Uh, and then if you include the big three, uh, well, if you did only lambda intra, so if you only do intra industry common ownership, by the big three and by others, the big three have either a negative and significant or negative and non-significant effect on prices. Uh, and the others have a positive and highly significant effect on uh, airline prices. So the correlation between common ownership and prices is driven by the other shareholders and not by the big three. And then if we divide it into intra and inter, then we see that in both cases, we see a positive effect of intra, both for the big three and for the others, and the negative effect of inter, uh, inter common ownership for the big three and for the others. Uh, but because the big three have much more inter-industry common ownership than the others, uh, the overall effect of the big three on prices is negative, while the overall effect of the others on prices is positive. So the price effect that we see 
is a combination of intra-industry, inter-industry, big three, and other. When you, combine, when you combine the inter and the intra of the big three, you get negative, but then you get the other shareholders having more intra-industry. That inter, when you combine those, you get a positive effect. And then when you combine everything overall, you get an effect that's closer to zero because of the big three, um, but still positive on average. Okay, and finally, we did an event study in which uh, we used the acquisition of BGI by, by BlackRock. Um, some airlines were more affected by others than others by this acquisition. And some airlines intra-industry was more affected, whereas for other airlines, inter-industry was more affected. So we calculate delta lambda intra, the implied change in intra-industry lambda for L and I, by doing a counterfactual in the pre-period of saying, okay, what if the, these asset managers had merged in the pre-period compared to not merged? And what would be the implied change in the lambda intra? And then the same for lambda inter. And then we, um, we have, a, some airlines were not really affected. So they're both in the, they're in the bottom tercile of both lambda intra, delta lambda intra and delta lambda inter. And then there's two treated groups. One that was more affected that are in the top tercile of lambda intra and the middle tercile of lambda inter. And one that's in the top tercile of lambda inter and in the middle tercile of lambda intra. Unfortunately, there's no airline that's in the top tercile of lambda intra and the bottom of lambda inter or vice versa. But you have some that were more affected in the intra and some that were more affected in the inter. Um, and then, well, we take the a balanced panel of road carriers and we match based on propensity score. Um, estimated using uh, rod characteristics, pre-treatment prices and HHI deltas from potentially confounding mergers. I mean, this event study has a few downsides, which is that there were a lot of airline mergers around this. So it's hard to identify this. So you have to, in the paper, in the previous airlines paper, we controlled for the airlines merger using the HHI deltas of the routes from these potentially confounding mergers. Here we put them in the propensity score and uh, to say, well, um, these HCI deltas, we use them to predict the propensity to be affected by the BlackRock BGI and we control for that. So, so that in the end, we match things with things that have the same propensity uh, to be affected once you control for the mergers. Okay, so we obtain markets that are quite uh, similar in terms of their control variables such as income per capita, population, HHI, and so on. And we run this event study. And this is what it looks like. Uh, basically, the, for the, when you put both treatments groups together, it's positive. You see a positive effect of the BlackRock BGI acquisition on prices. But this is coming from the ones that um, were in the top tercel of Delta Lambda Inter and the middle tercel of Delta Lambda Inter. Then there, the, the positive effect is uh, even larger. For the ones that were in the top tercel of the inter and the middle tercel of the lambda intra, uh, there was essentially a zero effect or maybe slightly negative. Um, so this to me is, is consistent with this idea that the inter-industry common ownership is canceling out or even maybe going a little further, the intra-industry uh, common ownership positive effect on prices. Um, so that's about it. Maybe this is a good time for questions. I mean, I concluding remarks is essentially Everything, I, well, okay, let me conclude a, a little bit, um, but maybe I'll talk more with the questions. So um, essentially the, this common ownership literature is based on partial equilibrium reasoning. Um, uh, the whole theory and the whole idea that we're gonna test this by taking all these industries are, and seeing if there's a price increase when there's more common ownership, I think is wrong. Uh, I think we have to think about it in terms of general equilibrium. Uh, at the same time, the fact that in general equilibrium, there isn't this general idea that the prices will be higher in all the industries. Uh, it doesn't mean that common ownership is not a problem. It just means that common ownership is probably, if it's a problem, it will be more likely to be a problem for uh, labor markets and for monopsony and things like that. Uh, and this is something that uh, we've been working on also with uh, UH2 and Aaron Sojourner. Uh, so that's it. I mean, it's essentially it's like in the last few years, what I wanted to tell you is 
Um, my thinking on common ownership has changed and my focus has gone more from product markets to, to labor markets and also to things like carbon emissions. Um, and I think that those are also, also seems to be things that the big three actually tend to focus more on. Uh, I think that there's no anecdotal evidence that the big three are interested in raising prices in any industries. Uh, it could be that in some industries they want to because this is more like kind of an in general, equilibrium is symmetric, kind of like if you take it like as an average thing. As in general, they don't want to raise prices. It could be that in some industry they do. Uh, the fact that they think about wages and whether wages could go up too, too fast or, or things like that, uh, there's more anecdotal evidence of that, I think. And the fact that they think about things like carbon emissions, there's also a lot of anecdotal evidence of that. They write about that all the time. Uh, and this, um, so okay, I'll, I'll, that's it. I'll, co I'll conclude with that. This is a preview of the of the structural stuff, but I'll conclude with that and I'll, I guess I'll open to questions. Thank you very much. And thanks also for showing us the development or your thoughts on something that we don't know. I think is also thought provoking that you are questioning yourself as time passes. Uh, we have some time for q and I would start uh, with Alessio and if others have questions, please raise your hand and we collect your inputs. Thank, thanks very much uh, for this uh, very interesting, uh, as Eduardo said, very thought provoking pre presentation. I have one remark and another question that, that relates to the other paper uh, on, on, on emissions. The first, I think, um, in order to make an interpretation on why you don't find any impact of the uh, big three common ownership on 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 um, on price levels um, you, we need we need to have a, have a theory of governance of the big three what are their incentives and I, I don't think we are quite yet there uh, also the discussion of who is owning who are the owners who are the rich or the poor owner it depends really on the beneficiaries of this and this is a little bit in a flux so the beneficiary also may change and I don't think you can easily assume that they're representing one uh, group of stakeholders or others. And the second uh, point is more related with, with the, uh, the sustainability debate and the emission paper. So uh, there is this paper by, by Mark Crow, uh, recent paper by Mark Crow, that in order for any kind of stakeholderism to be viable, uh, you need to have uh, and not hyper-competitive environment. So in that respect, it is quite consistent that, you, that, that big three uh, pursue on the one hand the reduction of climate change and the emissions, and uh, they, they wanna keep uh, the competitive environment not too aggressive because otherwise uh, one goal would exclude the others. And I don't know how your findings fit with this. Thanks. Um, uh... Thank you for the questions. Yeah, it's true that um, if firms are perfectly competitive, there isn't a lot of margin for any stakeholder considerations, right? Um, I guess, well, maybe for some firms there could be. Yeah, I mean, let, let's think about that actually. Is it, would it be good to think about that a little bit more? And um, I, I should think about that more too. There could be. I mean, could could it be if firms are perfectly competitive? Could there be uh, any margin for stakeholders? I guess there could be because there are some firms are going to be infra marginal, right? And they may have positive profits that they could maybe share with their stakeholders or something, right? I mean, it's, if you have the, the supply and demand graph, right, in perfect competition, uh, and let's say that we have different oil producers, right, and some have very low marginal costs and have, some have high marginal costs. There's the, the last producer, right? Uh, has zero. Short, short term, you mean? No, no, the no. Short term no. equilibrium. So no, long term no. equilibrium is flat. So there's no infra margin. They all, in general equilibrium. What, what do you mean in long term equilibrium is flat? In, in, in long term, there's no infra margin. I mean, they're all, the curve is flat. The supply curve is flat? Yeah. Um, well, no, but even, even in the long term, there's going to be some suppliers that have lower lower costs, I think. And those 
are going to be making positive profits, maybe even in the long term. Um, and so they could potentially do things for stakeholders. And I think the one that the highest cost producer that still survives, they, they, they can't, right? So anyway, it's something to think about. Um, whether you could you could have this in under perfect competition. Definitely when within perfect competition, you have some some scope for, for stakeholder theory. Now, I was reading today BlackRock's uh, Larry Fink's uh, letter to CEOs that came out, I think, today, in the 2022 one. Uh, and he talks about stakeholder capitalism, but it sounds, I think he's sounding more and less and less stakeholder and more and more like um, Jensen's enlightened profit maximization, calling that stakeholder capitalism. I think it's sounding more and more like saying like companies to create profits for the long run, they have to treat their customers and their employees well. And that to me sounds a lot like enlightened profit maximization, which in, is really what Friedman uh, said is uh, if you don't misinterpret him. Um, so I think that, I don't know, I find this stakeholder stuff actually super confusing. Um, I think that there's, to me, there's two, two kinds of, and I'm really not an expert on this stakeholder uh, debate. And I honestly, I found it really confusing. Maybe, you, maybe I can ask you a question. <laughs> It's like, how do you think about, about this stakeholder thing? Because to me, there's two types of stakeholder uh, capitalism. It's one in which you give the stakeholders control rights, like real control rights, like uh, uh, mid vestimung and co-determination and this kind of stuff. And it may have pros and cons. And then there's, uh, I'm not saying it's what you want to do. And, and then there's stakeholder capitalism of, of BlackRock and uh, where you uh, talk about it and you say, we care about the stakeholders, but they have, the stakeholders don't have any real control uh, except as shareholder consumers. So there's, there's something stakeholder there. So I guess, let me take it back. I mean, there's something real about stakeholder capitalism, which is the shareholders are consumers, right? And they don't want to increase the CPI. And I think that's real um, because that reduces the real value of their wealth. As, but not re with respect to the workers, we just want to keep the workers, if we're the owners, owner consumers, we just want to keep the workers uh, happy enough that they're productive and they, we don't have a lot of turnover and things like that. And that sounds like what Larry Fink uh, says. Let me find, let me see if I can find the letter. I was reading it um, just now. Uh, but, I, but it was more, I mean, if I may elaborate, I mean, there are two, two, two different things. I mean, uh, you, you can, it's true that stakeholderism is, is confusing because it puts together a lot of topics that are different. But the point is, if you want to correct externalities, which is not like what you know, classical economists would, would predict, mm -hmm. you need to have some scope for it. And mm -hmm. there may be other reasons, purely political reason, why you want to have companies to correct externalities. Uh, and the, the argument that I was like citing is the argument that you need uh, the, the environment, the, the product market, not to be extremely competitive, to have space to do that. Um, yeah, I just wonder if that's true, if you have heterogeneity, maybe some of the best firms might actually have some scope to do that. Definitely you do have scope to do that if you have market power, right? So that makes the logic a little easier. Uh, I don't know, I need to think about it. I, I, it sounds to me that like some firms have some margin to do whatever they want, even under competition. No, not whatever they want, but to not, not just maximize profits. Um, because they're gonna have, some firms might have positive profits in equilibrium, even under perfect competition. And those firms could decide to do whatever they want with those profits. Um, maybe it's a bad idea, but they could, right? And so they could decide to reduce externalities and make less money. And those, so basically what I'm saying is, Market power is one source of profits, but there are other sources of profits in equilibrium that are not necessarily market power. Um, they could be, but in a way it could be like control of some research, scarce resources that others don't have, like some very cheap oil wells 
uh, I mean, some very, very low cost, low marginal cost oil wells or, or things like that, which is kind of like market power, but not, but not exactly the same. Um, so I think that profits, positive profits are, are necessary, but maybe market power is not necessary. Thank you. Is there anybody else that urges to make a final remark? So I was wondering, I was wondering, you said that uh, you've shifted your, you know, now, now you're thinking more about the uh, labor market implications. And where the idea is that presumably uh, the big three, you know, they might, they might care about uh, stakeholders in general, as you refer now to the BlackRock's uh, CEO's uh, letter from today. So is that, I mean, you don't, you don't have to do it, of course, but I'm just wondering, have you, do you have any evidence in your data or have you seen something that uh, would um, justify this type of thinking in the sense that uh, do we observe that um, firms where uh, the big three have larger holdings uh, treat their employees better, you know, their better wages, maybe their, I don't know, culture or whatever, you know, the rankings of how, uh, workers think about these firms uh, is better and you know and to what extent of course there, there is also huge indigeneity you know it could be that uh, the big three attracted all these type of firms or they're causing this type of change do we have any evidence on that well we're looking at the effect of common ownership on, on wages not about the big three in particular but about common ownership and it doesn't to have a negative effect on wages so wages are lower yeah. when the big three are there uh, not when the big three are there, but when, oh, sorry, yeah, when there's also, common ownership, there is. Yeah, when a firm enters the index and you get um, more common ownership, that uh, that lowers wages relative to similar firms. So, but that somehow yeah. goes against uh, what you're saying that uh, you know, if you're a universal owner, as you call them, then you care about uh, you know workers in general. No, wouldn't wouldn't that uh, intuition imply that workers should be paid better? As opposed to uh, worse? No, no. I mean, not in the theory. I mean, if, um, maybe, maybe in the end they care about the workers. But in the theory, at least in the in the in the Azaria theory, it they they care about consumers, but they don't they don't necessarily care about workers, right? And they they may want to use their market power, uh, their increased market power over workers, uh, but not uh, not over consumers. So you squeeze you squeeze workers, which lowers your costs, which uh, then makes uh, you know consumers better off because they can ultimately buy at lower prices. Is this the idea? Um, it, it's not exactly that like you lower the costs by lowering the wages. It's just that you have a, a product market wedge and a labor market wedge, and you choose the product market wedge to be zero, and then you choose to extract rents from the labor market wedge. But um, because it's generic loom, the the price level is arbitrary. So it's like, you can have higher prices or lower prices. The important thing is that the wages are below the prices. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So it's not like you're lowering prices for consumers by reducing the wages. It's just that you reduce the wages to make money for the, for the shareholders. Oh, it's kind of, kind of related, no? <laughs> if wages were high, you have to increase prices. <laughs> um, well, but you could increase, increase prices more than the wages. I understand. I understand. Or it, it, it doesn't matter. It's but like it's you, it's you lower about the prices, prices and the wages, no? but the wages not as much. You could reduce the prices and the wages. Yeah. It, okay. It's about the relative, uh, the real wage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me thank once again uh, Professor Ozeza for accepting our invitation, and I hope to see you all at the next seminar that uh, will take place on the twenty second of February. You will receive an invitation. And the ones who have a one-on-one -on -one meeting can stay in this meeting. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a nice day. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, one thing, I, I, I need to join a department meeting on Zoom. Can I rejoin this, with this Zoom link later? Uh, for yes. At 2.30? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Eduardo, hey, <clears throat> I got a... Uh... Okay, uh, Alessio, you're the first of the for the one. Yeah, one. but that's so two you, thirty, you can, right? Okay. Yeah, so two thirty. Right. So you can you can join and then. Uh, but then, the, if I so, so uh, I can join with that link. Yes, you 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 are the first one. You are alternative host.
I will also so, log in at 2.30 to be on the safe side and see if everything So works. we close this meeting and I reopen it at 2.30. And then yes. I pass the baton to Jose. I mean, I, I can also stay in the meeting. It's, it's uh, not a problem. It, I have are, are you in lunch in this 40 minutes. No, I am, are you in the uh, list? I am uh, after you, Alessio. So what you can do is you can make me co-host. And then I no, can. No, make... you. I cannot change the design of the meeting, but don't worry. I will be first, and I pass the baton to Jose. So the moment, you know, you you will arrive, and I'm still there, so it's not a problem. Okay. But then he, he will keep being a host, so that he can talk to these four people, and that's it. Okay. okay. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, talk to you later. Yes. Bye.